So thank you so much for joining me, you beautiful soul. My name is Emily Bauman, and I'm gonna be your guide and your friendly journey leader on this path today. Thank you for acknowledging yourself as a light worker, as a star seed, as a really sensitive soul. And the fact that you're here means you're a leader and you're leading the way in this beautiful new era. So I hope you can feel the significance of that and know that I'm so grateful for your presence. Like I'm so happy you're here. My name is Emily Bauman and my own journey as a homesick star seed started when I was 11 years old, if you can believe it. So some of us start this feeling of yearning for home when we're children. Others, maybe it's this year that you woke up to the reality that you're a multidimensional being. And so in this beautiful session that we're gonna have together, first I'm gonna share my own story. Then I'm gonna tell you the cosmic story of you, of all of us. And this in and of itself is gonna be a shifter for you. It's gonna be a game changer. And then we're gonna shift into what to do about it. Some more practical tools, practices and perspectives that's really gonna assist you from here on in. But before we jump into all of that goodness, I always like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So we are shifting in this era to being people who work on the land to people who work with the land. We don't own her. We are here to support and uplift her, right? You can feel that shift. And so I take this moment to acknowledge that I have the honor of working and living on Mayan land. And the ancestral name for this land is Zama. And this land belongs to the ancestors living a present, past, future. And I'm so grateful to Zama for supporting this conversation today. And so wherever you are, I just, you know, invite you to begin your day, begin your work by acknowledging the land, the ancestral land that you live and work on. Isn't that fun? All right, so mm, let's take a moment to take a deep breath in and exhale. And if you haven't already, grab any blankets, tea, cozy things that will make you really feel like this session of Earth School is supportive and grounded more than ever. Feel the earth between your feet. If you're sitting, stomp your feet a little bit. And I would just invite you to close your eyes. And in order to ground in more fully, you're going to imagine a beautiful silver cord. And one side of this silver cord is hooking around your left hip bone. You feel it, it's like a silver, beautiful chain. And the other side of this beautiful silver chain is hooking around your right hip and your left hip. So we have left and right hip beautifully anchored. Breathe into that. Mm. And now watch as this beautiful silver chain, almost like it has elven engravings on it. It is sinking down into the center of the earth. So watch it move down through lava, through rocks, through limestone, through beautiful rose quartz. And with the magical quickness, it just sinks down and hooks around the center of the Earth's heart, her core. And this is the Earth star. It's a very magical realm inside the center of the Earth. So take a deep breath in. Feel that connection between your left and your right hip anchored really deeply into the center of the Earth, into the Earth star. And now we're going to Tune into the top of our heads. Take a deep breath in and breathe some energy into the crown of your head. And now imagine a golden cord encircling your head like a tiara, like you are a cosmic queen, like a radiant king. Can you feel it? Imagine this beautiful golden cord encircling your forehead and your crown. Take a deep breath in, giving it realness, giving it energy. And now imagine with the power of your beautiful awareness, 
that this cord of gold is swirling up, 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 and it's rising up beyond your city, through the skies, up, up, up it goes, up further and even higher, it's exiting the stratosphere, <laughs> up, up, up it goes, past the stars, rising up, 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 higher still, until this golden cord connects to the beautiful center of the sun. And it latches in there into its golden home. And the light starts to emanate from the sun, radiating down through this golden cord. So take a deep breath in and feel how real that is, that you are now suspended and connected to the source of all love through this beautiful golden cord from the perfect center of your brow and feel how strongly you are held, breathing into the silver cord through your hips into the center of the earth star herself. And from this beautiful place of being supported and safe and centered, I welcome you. I welcome all of you. I welcome your beautiful presence now. I welcome everyone you've ever been. I welcome your ancestors. I welcome your cosmic guides, whoever wishes to join you on this journey with me. And we're here today because you've acknowledged yourself as a multidimensional being, as a star seed, a light worker, whatever name feels alive to you in this moment is perfect and good. And what it means is that all of us share a story. We share certain feelings that come up and they may look like, I'm so alone, or how did I get here? <laughs> Why is it so dense? Oh my gosh, I'm looking around. This is impossible to fix. I give up, I can't fix this. Let's just call it a day. I would like to press the eject button. Raise your hand if this is familiar to you, if you've ever felt this. If you're watching the replay, raise your hand. And the thing is that it's all perfect because what we're gonna see in the second half of this beautiful journey together is that these aches, these yearnings are basically indicators of underlying emotions that are gonna guide us home to wholeness. Mm, you feel how yummy that is? We're gonna use these aches. We're gonna use these sources of discomfort to guide us into new levels of being. And you're gonna be an inspiration to everyone around you in ways you didn't even know possible. And so I know this on a personal level. <laughs> so little Emily grew up in Haiti. I don't know if you know this about me, but my parents were very intrepid travelers. They were rebels, they were renegades, they were mavericks and humanitarian workers. And so I found myself at age seven kicked out of this comfortable nest-like home in Southern Ontario, Canada, a very Anglophone environment where we played kick the can and kids could run around freely. No one thought about danger. And all of a sudden my parents decided to move us to the polar opposite. We moved to Port-au-Prince, Haiti in the mid nineties. Port-au-Prince, Haiti, it was a land, Afro-Caribbean, incredibly rich, to me, it was an unknown of unparalleled proportions, new language, new school. So you can imagine that I felt like the otherness was super accentuated. Fast forward a few years, I found myself one night at dusk. I remember the sun was setting and I'd climbed up this ladder to the rooftop of my parents' house. And it was my favorite place to be. Pretty much every night I would climb up this ladder and the roof was flat so I could stand there and see the mountains that seemed to go on forever. We have a saying in Haiti that it's the land of mountains beyond mountains, mon de mon. And so I could look at the ocean to my left, the mountains that stretched on forever. And all I wanted to do was fly there because I could viscerally remember my wings. Have you had that ever happen to you where you can remember? Yeah, some of you are acknowledging. 
And if not, that's okay. We all have different experiences. But all I wanted to do is 11 year old Emily standing on this rooftop was dive off and just finally be free. I looked around at the, the political violence and I'll get real with you. We would drive to school and sometimes there would be dead bodies in the street. Like it was a very dark time in Haiti's history. There was a coup d'etat military takeover. And so I was being exposed to the densest that humanity has to offer. And I know a lot of you have had experiences too that feel like you may not get over it. And so I just meet you in that place and I know it can get so intense. And sometimes it doesn't have to be from an external place. Sometimes it can be just our own lived environment. The environment of emotions that we have inside of ourselves can feel so heavy that we can't bear it. And so there I was wanting to jump off and just be free and press the eject button. I didn't feel the love that I remembered was possible. And so I didn't jump. Like so many of us, we have this inner knowing, this beautiful mother and father that guide us, this cosmic parent, this inner voice that says, no, baby, you're going to make it. There's more for you. And that's it. That's why we're here today, to talk about that more, to acknowledge the depth of the darkness that we experience and then as light workers and beings find beautiful ways forward to dance this dance of life together. And so like so many of our beautiful light worker kindreds, I went on to become a humanitarian worker. I said, I must save humanity. And my parents are humanitarian workers. And so I worked for global charities. I raised $50 million at the United Nations and I was in communications and I was a bridge between the English speaking world and then my Haitian co-workers and colleagues. And I was giving, 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 giving until I was exhausted. And then I would go home and paint because like so many of us, I needed to express myself creatively to just feel like I was gonna survive. So the reason I'm telling you my origin story is because none of it really made sense until I started to dive into the cosmic side of things. And today is my coming out party, yay! <laughs> because up until now, it has not felt safe and good and right for me to admit just how incredibly multi-dimensional multi and oracular I am. And now it's so perfect because as this left brain woman who exited the corporate world, the professional overgiver, the professional humanitarian, I get to stand up and be like, hey, we get to be powerful women, we get to be bosses, we get to be business owners, and 100% cosmic too. You feel me? Does that resonate? Mm. Yeah. And so from this place, let's just take a deep breath before we go on this cosmic origin story of you, because this is a big one. And I've been gathering this information since I was 11 years old, speaking to voodoo priests and mambos and candoble elders and being immersed in the Christian church culture and doing a five-year degree in philosophy, reading every single book I could get my hand on, classical literature, Greek literature, the hermetic arts, reading every single version of the Bible. I read the Bible cover to cover when I was 10 years old. Who does that? So I know in my heart of hearts that as a scribe, as an ancient astrologer, and as a librarian that I, I feel uniquely prepared to share this story with you, if that makes sense. So ah, to begin the cosmic origin story of you, I would invite you to get cozy and begin by closing down your beautiful eyes, if that feels good. Take a deep breath, close your eyes, and imagine yourself floating on a pink cloud and you're floating on a cloud, maybe you're laying on your back and you feel this delightful fluffiness. It's at once solid and it's weightless and you feel weightless and also supported. 
and you just kind of giggle and laugh because it's very confusing to feel solid and weightless at the same time. So you're on this floating cloud. You turn over on your belly and you look down. And there you are floating and suspended. And as you peer over the edge of this beautiful pink cloud, you look down at a world of water. And so you see what seems like water, endless, endless water stretching for miles and miles. And you can feel light emanating from the surface of this water. And you're breathing it in and you're curious because how can anything emanate from water? But you're feeling the energy and you're feeling the perfect harmony and you feel love emanating up like an invisible wave rising from the water and it immerses your own being and you realize you are also the water. And then you watch in fascination as something really cool starts to happen. It's like rain made of light. Imagine rain of light starting to pelt the surface of the water. Ping, 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 ping. And everywhere that the light touches the water, it starts to bounce up. And it bounces up in reaction to the water. And when this happens, an individual essence emerges from the water. And you can sense it. Ping, ping, ping. The light is showering down like a rainfall of joy and curiosity and playfulness. And it doesn't hit every surface of the ocean. You watch as specific rain showers hit specific parts of the surface of this beautiful, perfect water. And then what happens? It's as if this tidal wave of beautiful water droplets begins to rise up from the surface of the water and it begins to shoot out from the planet and go and explore. Because what is happening, what's happening is that the oneness, the source of all love has decided to go and experience itself differently. And that, my love, is the origin of you as a soul. Because you're still infused with the oneness that connects all. You're still connected with the oneness that unites everything, that spirit. But in this moment, you became an individuated soul. And your soul has its own architecture. And so just breathe into that acknowledgement now as we continue with the beautiful cosmic origin story of you. Mm. So what happens is you go on this journey of evolution. There are three phases of the soul. It starts in unity, and then it begins an individual experience of ego, of the I, so that it can go and learn and explore and have experiences on both sides of the spectrum until it's learned everything it can and it comes home to wholeness. But this time, it's a return in innocence. Okay, and so here's where things get really interesting. So imagine you're this beautiful water droplet, you become an individuated soul, you go, Pew, I'm gonna go and explore the multiverse. And your soul, like I said, is its own architecture. It has its own assignment and it has a home planet assignment. <laughs> so we know that there are, in one way of seeing things, 22 major star kingdoms, 22 major planets in our game of life. And all of this that I'm telling you now is also available in a recording that I'm going to send you after. So if you choose to be fully present and take in this transmission, you are so welcome. So the 22 planets each get souls. You get an assignment. Some go to Venus, this pink, luscious purple planet where the creatures look kind of like fuzzy elephants, but it's hard to describe them and they're just pure love. And some go to the Pleiadians, the green planets, the star system of the Pleiades. And some go to the Sirius star nation. Others go to the Arcturian and others go to the Orion or the Draco and we can go on and on. And what happens is that that's where you begin the school of you. That's where you begin to learn and really grow in lessons until you've graduated from that star and then you go somewhere else. And there are 
endless schools. If you listen to Dolores Cannon or ever watch any of her interviews or read the books Convoluted Universe, to say it's convoluted, my love, is just the beginning. There are dimensions and dimensions where you have played, where you have learned, where you have made mistakes, and you have changed people's lives. <laughs> and then something really interesting happened. All of us, pretty much without exception, chose to become involved in seeding new planets. So you graduated enough to the point that you were a master creator. Your soul had enough experience where you were asked to become part of the architecture of terraforming. And you were creating new planets with this intellect, this wisdom, like a divine architect. And you were a DNA manipulating genius. Like what we know now about DNA sequencing is a joke compared to what you know how to do in the fullness of you. Okay, so you're passing through this phase, you've gone from being one with everything to assigned a home planet where you know you have like your core personality and then pretend you're like an exchange student. And so you've learned on other planets, maybe you've picked up an accent, you've dated some cute guys from different planets and you've learned how to speak foreign languages. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna get my first real job terraforming and creating new planets. Cool. And then you graduate into more of a CEO position. You go back to your home planet and things start to get interesting because collectively all of these water droplets are evolving together into a phase of ego that needs to really exert its power to come to learn the next lesson. And this is interesting because power is this illusion of returning to oneness and love. You follow me? So it's as if in our seeking of returning home to oneness, we follow this false loop of seeking control, of seeking acknowledgement, of seeking validation. And power can even feel like love, you know? We can get intoxicated with this power and it can feel like it's resolving the core wound. But the reason that you're here today is because you're acknowledging that it's not the way and that we are at a phase collectively in human development where we are stepping off the wheel of karma. And all that means is that we are ending the desire for power. Ending the wheel of karma just means ending the desire for power over. You feel me? Does that resonate? Raise your hand, leave me a little acknowledgement if you're like, yes, I am. And at this point, it would be really useful before we get into the war part of the cosmic story of you. It's helpful for me to distinguish a concept, which is light worker souls versus earth souls. So light worker souls are the early, early birds, the ones who first emerge from the cosmic oneness in order to experience individuation, to go on the journey of ego, of self-realization and return finally to oneness. And then there's like an ongoing factory, an ongoing process. And some of those are earth souls. So earth is a young planet in the grand scheme of things. You know what I mean? And so earth souls happen to be a little bit younger. And all of us in this room, all of us in this container, you listening are light worker souls. But that doesn't mean we've always been of the light. <laughs> so at this point in the cosmic origin story of you, you got up to some naughty things, baby. You got up to some not so good, good events. And I say this lightheartedly on purpose because we just get to make play out of the worst behavior. We get to acknowledge, accept, and forgive everything we've ever done. And if there's nothing else you remember from this journey with me is that we get to acknowledge and forgive everything we've ever done and everyone we've ever been, okay? Because that's the jump off point of releasing the weariness of the ache, of the pain, of the guilt, the responsibility, the yearning to fix it. And we're gonna talk about all of that in a minute. 
But now it's time to talk about the war and the cosmic origin story of you. So these 22 star nations decided to go to battle. Star Wars is pretty much a documentary. <laughs> and so we even had entire planets destroyed because at this point, the light worker beings on Arcturus, on the Pleiades, on Sirius A, B, and on Karnak, we had a level of technology where from our minds, we could manifest stronger than atomic bombs. Because we know that mind creates matter. We know that energy first and that matter reflects it, right? And that materialism, it's a nice little illusion that we've been living in on earth since the age of reason. And now we're saying, thank you, reason. And we're just taking a higher perspective. And we're saying, okay, mind creates matter. And in these cosmic galactic wars, you in this moment were able to destroy entire planets with the amplified technology using crystals, using sound, light, and the founding harmonics of the universe you could destroy. And at certain points, you used your power to annihilate and destroy because you felt justified. You felt the need to do it. You felt like you had no other choice. And you were saying things like, it's your fault. You made me do this. And we lost beautiful planets like Lyra. And so if you've ever looked at a person and said, that person looks like a cat. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> Have you ever had that experience where like, that's not a human, that's a cat or that's a bird. So that home planet, Lyra, was particularly involved in seeding and founding Earth and was one of the first star people to come to Earth and say, we're going to stay and we're going to make this experiment go right. And it was destroyed in the Orion Wars. And so there's still a lot of pain um, wrapped up in all of the damage that was done. But then fast forward to a point where the power struggles just kind of evened out and there was a stalemate and no one could destroy one another. Much like the Cold War between Russia and the United States where everyone armed up, nuked up and then no one could budge. And so what happened was proxy wars. And this is where earth comes in. Dun, da, da. So we talked about the three phases of evolution, right? Where like first you're in oneness and then you're like, I wanna be an ego and like explore and learn to be an individual soul. So that was happening on earth. There were these really interesting human apes. There were Cro-Magnons and there were Homo sapiens and there were Neanderthals and they were really stepping out of their symbiotic relationship with nature for the first time. And they were like, I am. They were recognizing their I am presence. And this sent ripple effects across the multiverse because we know from particle theory that we're all experiencing all things simultaneously on one level. And the cosmic beings that you and I were, those light workers, those powerful star seed cousins, we picked up on these signals. We're like, oh, something's happening in the backwater of Earth, of Gaia. And what we sensed was that these beings were ready to start having their own individuation. So everyone kind of gathered on earth and we started to play with the humans and we started to exert control on the humans, team A, team B, you know, red team, green team. And we made them fight one another because we couldn't fight in the stars anymore. So I just invite you to take a, a breath in and just really acknowledge what it might mean for you to have been a bad guy. And what would it mean for you to have been someone who was a queen from another planet who came to earth and said, this is, this is what we're doing now. That there are these creatures and we're going to tweak them and we're going to make them work for us. They're gonna mine gold so that we can fix our atmosphere. And that's totally fine because of our willpower, because of our technology, we can, therefore we should. It's a lot, it's a lot to acknowledge. And it's one of the key takeaways from this journey together of you and I is acknowledging that we've played all the roles. So if you can imagine 
that there were Neanderthals all of a sudden who went from just stoking fires to developing iron shields, to having blades that could chop off each other's heads to create genocide. And we know scientifically that this happened. For example, if you look at the book Sapiens, which is a very scientific account, exhaustive and completely rational, he says, we don't know why, but within a span of 100 years, the Neanderthals went from just Cro-Magnon, just kind of like skirmishes, to then one completely wiping the other out. Like, how does that happen? And so one explanation would be, well, listen to this. The star nations started manipulating our DNA through the same technology I mentioned earlier, whereby they can imagine and energetically create something and then reflect it on the DNA level. And so the fear impulses were magnified in the humans that really relax. I'm just going to go with the flow, respond to nature, be in symbiotic relation to nature that was dulled down and our intellect and our ability to reason was amplified. And we were given philosophy and we were given really powerful maps of the stars. We were given magic. We were given words that could create blasts of energy and harm each other as well as weapons. And so this is what a lot of us today are struggling with is this genetic imprint of being involved in these wars. Because what happened in the story on Earth is that eventually the star beings, the light workers, they got tired. They were transferring so much of their egoic awareness into the humans that they actually started to phase out of that entire soul evolution. And so you and I, in that phase, we took a step back and we got a little tired and we just let the humans play and start to, you know, kind of create kingdoms. And this is around the time of ancient Egypt where the gods were all of a sudden left, you know, the, they set priests and priestesses in charge and they just kind of pulled back. And that's the advent of the gurus, the age of heroes. Does that make sense to you? They got tired and weary and they just said, what are we doing? So they pulled back. So this is really important that we shifted from stalemate in the stars to proxy wars on earth and really incredible genetic manipulations of humans, which wasn't only fear ramp up, instinct turned down. It was also advancing our ability to commune with ancient technologies from each of the 22 star nations. And something really cool happened is that because they mapped us with so much of their DNA, we were able to eventually have these star nation individuals, these light worker beings incarnate into human being form. And that's how we got where we are today. Isn't that kind of cool? Mm. And so I just fast forward to now, fast forward to now, and I'm going to turn on a presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna do a little share screen with all of you beauties. Mm. Just let that sink in. What does that mean? Because we're gonna get into some new era tools and resources that are really gonna help you shift. I'm so sure of it. And wherever you are on your journey, whether this is all new to you, whether you feel like you've kind of heard this all before, I just invite you to hear it with an open mind today because you know you can hear the same information from someone different and it just really absolutely shifts the way you see everything. There are some core feelings that have brought you to this workshop. Guilt maybe, however unacknowledged, shame, unwelcome, unworthiness and maybe you don't acknowledge those as such because they come up as this like cosmic sadness or like frustration and anger like how are humans this dumb how are we still destroying trees or escapism how can i get out of here or like please mother starship just pick me up i don't know what planet i'm from but mayday mayday 
And for a lot of us, and me personally, it tends to come up as tiredness. As my friend Juliana and I sometimes say, it's like, I'm like 500,000 years old. Am I done already? And what's really interesting is that we get to totally reframe how we got these core wounds. I'm gonna bring in a piece of psychology here because I have found that when we take the cosmic look, when we pop out and see the whole story of us as fantastical as it may be, the entire point, my love, is to come back into the body. The entire point of knowing just how vast and multidimensional you are from where I stand is to help make you a better adjusted human and to make you more in tune with your emotions than ever and to really come into this life and empower you and inspire you to live it like only you can live it. And so let's continue. A few books that reframe the story of you that I'm drawing from are Dolores Cannon, Everything She's Ever Written, DNA of the Gods by Chris Hardy, Anna, Grandmother of Jesus, and the Joshua Channelings. So I'm dropping these nuggets here and you'll also get an email of this presentation. So no need to write anything down. Mm, okay, now we're gonna jump into the good good. What I'm presenting to you right now is the Karpman Drama Triangle. And it took me a hot minute to remember the name Karpman. So the way I remember it personally is carp, like the fish, man, Karpman, Stephen Karpman. Thank you so much. And what he has shown us is that through this lack of power, through this karma, what we do is we take different extreme positions on the outside of this triangle. When we're relating to other humans, when we're relating to situations, when we're relating to life itself, we can take the top position, which is the savior. And the savior says, let me help you. And the savior is like, oh, I'm gonna fix that for you. Don't you worry. And that seems really nice on the surface, but it only provides temporary relief. And there's this underpinning need to be needed. And then the next one is the victim. Poor me. And you feel like you're at the mercy of life, at the mercy of your boss, at the mercy of your relationship, at the mercy of your bank account, whatever the balance is, mercy me. And you feel downtrodden, like, oh, helpless. Does that ring a bell? Like we've all felt that at some point, right? Like something is impacting me and the effect of it. And you're just reacting to it. And then the third point is the persecutor position. And this is a role that you take when you're feeling angry, when you need someone to blame, it's all your fault. And this actually might sound most familiar to you because a lot of us struggle to take this position that we're the bad guy, but how often have you said to yourself, I should work harder. I shouldn't have said that to her. I should have handled that more gracefully. Those are also persecutor positions. Mm -hmm. And so what takes us around the circle are different emotions. And all of this starseed talk comes home to our emotions. And so the emotions of blame and resentment can drive you from the position on the top of savior. Let me rescue you, man. When I was in the United Nations and I worked over and over again, and it just felt like the hurricanes never stopped coming and the natural disasters didn't abate. I was working in refugee camps and they just never stopped growing. Let me help you, let me help you. We did this temporary fixes. We built 2000 tent cities and it was never enough. And eventually this blame and resentment can build up. We're like, oh, no matter what I do, it's never gonna help. And then you shift into this victim mode, like, oh my gosh, I tried so hard and I just couldn't. And then you feel like life is affecting you. You don't have enough money to get out and oh, but people need you and it's just not possible. And if you experience that long enough, you can get angry. And different emotions might activate for different people. These are the ones that feel truest for me. But I know that when I get angry enough, that's when I feel powerful enough to get out of that abusive relationship, to get out of that abusive relationship with my own work, 
with my own perspective on stress, whatever I'm feeling is pressing down on me. When I get angry enough, I feel powerful enough to go and dominate, okay? And then you're mean to yourself, and you're taking some steps, and eventually the emotion of guilt, like, ah, it's like remember in our story, the star nation light workers, the powerful ones causing the war in the humans, eventually they were flooded with the wave of guilt. And then they shift up to savior, let me help you. And it begins all over again. So now I just like to touch briefly on what it can look like on an earth level to return to wholeness. Leave a little wave if this is landing for you. I know some of you on the call are experts and I'm so grateful for your presence here to have professional therapists coming and learning how this is applicable on a karmic and spiritual level is super yummy. So the rescuer can become an empowered caring coach. When all the parts of you are brought back together you can shift from needing to fix everyone to being a support system for everyone. When the helpless victim comes home to wholeness and realizes they are powerful, they become a thriving creator. And that experience of being the victim allows them to speak about situations of abuse with realness, with empathy, with vulnerability that makes them a leader in their own way. And then our bully, our persecutor, when that person just steps into the wholeness, steps out from the edges of the triangle into the center once more, they become this sacred rebel. Do you identify at all with the archetype of the sacred rebel? Because it's a really important archetype on this planet. It's the power of assertion that leads to breakthroughs. You know what I mean? So we need people to think differently, to challenge the status quo, and that can be done in this challenger role. So how does this work on the karmic level? Because this is a talk about, this is a talk about homesick star seeds, right? So on the top of our Karpman drama triangle, gone karmic, we have the light worker hero. I'll change the planet. I'm gonna set things right. And so this links to our story because you in this lifetime and many, many, many recent lifetimes, maybe even thousands, have come to the earth as a priestess. You've come to earth as a wisdom keeper. You've come to earth as a mage, maybe as a priest. You've come to earth as a hero as an environmentalist, someone who is here to stand up for the little guy. You're like, we're not gonna be dominated anymore. I'm gonna set right things that I was involved in, in harming. But do you see how that energy is still the fix it energy of the savior? And how we got here today, my love, this exhaustion this sense of just needing to just get out of here is because I call it the burnt out priestess. You are an exhausted empath. Imagine you've spent 5,000 lifetimes in the sense of guilt, trying to set things right. And the earth wasn't ready for you. So you were burned. You were ejected from society. You were called a harlot. Your love of sensuality made you an outcast. Your connection to plants and desire to rekindle a harmonic connection with Gaia, they called you a witch. Can you imagine all the times you came forward with this energy of needing to fix where you were involved in harming and it just didn't go well? And you get tired and that's totally okay. We are here together. You are not alone. This is a story of us. And we are acknowledging that it is not helpful to be a burnt out priestess. And there's this victim energy that I would really encourage you to explore right now. Whenever you say, no one's listening, it's never gonna get better. And what's the point of it? I just 
yearn for the peace of home. I remember what it was like to be part of the oneness. I remember love and I'm tired of the illusions of power. I am tired of all of this ego. I'm tired of my own ego. I just want to get out of here. And can you see how that would just make you angry? And maybe even shift into this energy of like, fuck it. I look at certain people who are in positions of power today, who started out raising the flag saying, there's an AI takeover about to happen. Think about Elon Musk, where he did live interviews saying there is a battle imminent between artificial intelligence and the desire to merge artificial intelligence with humans and the sovereign organic human being. And he felt so unheard for 10 years that he's like, well, he literally said in an interview, if you can't beat them, join them. So you just give up, you get angry that you're unheard and you become a persecutor. And the good news is we're not gonna stay there. <laughs> we're gonna talk about what happens when the yearning gets strong enough to come home once and for all. We're gonna talk about cures. We're gonna talk about how there is absolutely no more need for external validation. There is no more need for self-judgment that you're not doing enough. There is no more need for you to exile parts of you that you're like, well, if that was bad. I'm guilty of so much stuff. So we're just gonna pretend that didn't happen, that all of those incarnations never happen. We're just gonna just, you know, do what everyone else does, no. What gets to happen is that we shift the parts of us that want to fix everything into these community leaders who are here to lead by example. We shift our burnt out yearning to get out of here into this familiarity with our unique creative life forces. And we're going to become new era creators. Hey, <laughs> this is so exciting because it's so real and the shifts get to happen now. The shifts literally get to happen when you combine your powerful awareness with information and make a choice. You just choose differently. And all of this energy of anger of the persecutor gets to shift into the acknowledgement that you are a light worker. You are one of the 22 founding kingdoms. You are kings and queens of ancient kingdoms and you are a wise one. And what does that mean? It means that you are a resource bringing ancient future technologies to the now. Whenever someone is channeling the Pleiades or they're channeling someone from Sirius B or collective consciousness, Personally, I'm convinced that they're literally just tuning into themselves in that dimension, in that reality, because it's all happening now in a, such a real way. So that's you. The serious B alien is you. And it may seem strange. It may seem like a stretch. Maybe you're like, uh, what is Emily going on about? And that's okay. Like different information is ready to land at different times. No judgment, no right or wrong. Let's take a deep breath here. Just allowing the power of the drama triangle to sink in, whether you know it or not, just having it presented in a different way. Maybe little nuggets are dissolving into your consciousness and landing in a new way. Mm. So, Living beyond the drama triangle, earth and karma, for me, it comes from four nuggets. Nuggets of wisdom, nuggets of things that I have found super helpful. Setting and enforcing our own boundaries. This is what I accept. This is what I do not accept. And just taking that stand and shifting into a space of empowerment. Look, my, my physical body, when I talk about boundaries, literally stands at attention. My heart pops up because when we're going through the earth and we're walking with boundaries intact, you're literally leading with your heart. It's like, oh, hello. 
because boundaries are made of love, as my dear friend Elizabeth Devon taught me. Boundaries are not mean or rude. They're not exclusionary. It's made of love. The second way that we live beyond the drama triangle comes from having a strong sense of your own agency and your personal power. You're in control. You make the choices. You're dancing with life. You decide how to react. You decide how to respond to the thoughts you're having. And that's really beautiful. And the third element is taking responsibility for your own well being. I don't know about you, but I love EFT tapping, emotional freedom technique. And I'm developing a variation called creative freedom technique to really focus on the creative life force aspect of our emotions. And it starts with taking responsibility for my own well being. So I invite you to do the same. And the fourth element of living beyond the drama triangle once and for all is embodying our juicy divine self worth. Because like we discussed, when on a very, very subliminal karmic level, we feel guilt of having caused harm, which was just part of our learning. We're not trying to make that right or wrong, but we may have that imprint of like guilt and that impacts our self worth. And if you remember nothing else, I hope that you remember that this feeling of never being enoughness, it may stem from childhood wounds, but it may stem from a feeling of guilt of things you did in other incarnations and lifetimes. And it is time to let it go. It is time to dissolve the guilt and allow it just to be accepted so that you can choose differently now and that you are worthy of the best life has to offer, that you are worthy of expressing your own core frequency in such a juicy way. And so here is a list of certain remedies for your homesick soul. If you're someone who really needs to latch on to the doing side, these are some resources. Mirror work, EFT tapping, Kundalini yoga, breath work. There's so many breath works. We have some breath workers here on the call right now, professionals. Get in touch with them. Try it. See if it works for you. Somatic body work. Getting into your body. Read the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Or just have conscious conversations. Develop intimacy with someone to a degree where you are breaking the chains of karma simply by allowing yourself to be seen. Take nature walks. What is more grounding than walking in a forest barefoot? What is more beautiful and feeling safe and secure than walking by the ocean? Another really beautiful remedy for myself personally has been learning about my human design. And what does that have to do with anything? Well, when it comes to getting in touch with your core frequency, your core genius, human design is this incredible overlay of astrology, your birth chart with the ancient oracle I Ching from Chinese traditions. So look up human design. If you would like recommendations, hit me up on Instagram. I can always chat with you. And finally, the real good good for me is self-forgiveness. Do you feel the power of that? Hmm. So shifting into the second half here, of really talking about remedies for real, expressing your wonderful self means that you acknowledge that you have a unique fingerprint. It's like a radio station of the universe is broadcasting through your body into life so it can be heard and impact others. No one else in the entire world will ever sing the song of you. And there's only one of you in this configuration for all time. So I, I would invite you to put your hands on your body right now and feel the realness of you and know that if you block your radio signal, it's never gonna be heard or seen or felt ever. And so that may seem really dramatic. And it's also this invitation to sing and share and express and write and teach and learn and stay vulnerable and humble so that you can offer the world all of you. 
You're wonderful. Emily said it, so you got to believe it. <laughs> and something that also really, really has helped me is self-forgiveness. Because we don't even know everything that we desire to forgive ourselves for. So just saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Getting intimate with your need to forgive yourself. The beautiful portal to just really coming into your humanity. What also helps is accepting that you're here for a big mission. You are like Harry Potter. And so are all your friends. Everybody gets to be Harry Potter and you're Harry Potter and you're Harry Potter. And your job is not to save the world. Your job is not to be the savior because the age of gurus and heroes is over. Like literally, the age of gurus and that one savior, that hero from the ancient Greek myth, it's over. Everybody is the hero. Everyone is the priest and priestess, the leader. The authority is in you. The Buddha is in you. And collectively, we are the Christ. So our job isn't to save the world unless we get to understand this paradox of really honing in on our core wounds and being intimate and vulnerable with our guilt, our shame, our sadness, and all the underlying feelings, getting intimate with that in a really beautiful, still way, like that's actually saving the world. So this desire to go out and fix other people, bring our partner along for the journey, make everyone keep up with us, is avoiding the actual work of developing the spiritual alchemy inside of us. We get to get vulnerable with our exiled parts. And I just did another powerful session with Elizabeth Devon about this. We get to be so vulnerable with our exiled parts, the parts of us that we can hardly stand to be in the room with. And we just get to be with them. And I don't know about you, but my tendency is to be like, oh, here's the problem, let me fix it. And now we just get to sit there and breathe with it. I really hope that, that this lands for you because while I mentioned breath work and you know kundalini yoga, the ancient technology of kundalini is amazing. And it gets to be so simple that you literally just need to breathe into the discomfort of the emotions that come up and be with them and ask them what they have to teach you. It's like you realize that you're a mother and father to a classroom of children who you've been ignoring and they're all scrambling for your attention and you just get to mother them and father them. And that is literally going to dissolve this feeling of needing to get out of here, this feeling of need to going somewhere else because it just gets to dissolve. And it's so easy. And maybe you're like, um, that's a lot. Where can I start? Everyone has different starting points. Discovering a community has been huge for me. When I moved to Tulum in 2020, it was the first time where I felt like I could be of service from a place of overflow, where everything around me was juicing me up. And so I was connecting with people. And then instead of like I did when I worked in the United Nations, where I was just giving from this dry well and feeling resentment build up, I was of service to my community, both in person and online from a place of overflow. And it was like this wellspring. And I invite you to try that and see how different it feels. Another thing is you may wanna try literally being seen. Like today is a great practice for me, just like you of being seen in my multidimensionality. What does that look like for you? Maybe it just means doing an Instagram live and talking about your karmic soul origin, your journey to discovering where you're from. Because while we're all from source, well, ultimately we're all from God, from the universe, from whatever you call that beautiful oneness that has never gone away, that permeates all our spirits, you're different. Because that's the whole point. Your soul is different. And so you get to be seen and kind of come out a little bit more so 
I double dare you to do an Instagram live and then tell me about it after. I'd be so happy. And then on the flip side, feeling held in a crisis and learning to receive is one of the best ways when you're feeling this yearning for home, when you're feeling like you just can't stand the density of earth anymore, tell someone and receive support. You know, end the self-judgment, end this harshness. Don't judge yourself. Don't think that you need to fit in anymore. <laughs> we get to be so different. We get to, you know, just absolutely stand out and not try and have validation from the outside. You feel me? And so as we're shifting towards q and I would just invite you to reframe something I hear a lot. That is part of the rejection of earth, part of the rejection of this home. People say, oh, this meat suit, I'm so tired of it. I just want to cast it off this body. It's so dense, it's so heavy. I remember not having to eat. Um, something that I used to say a lot is like, I remember because I'm from series B, water world. And on that planet, we get to morph from fairy into mermaid. And we just astrally morph no matter where we are into whatever shape we want. And that's like as fun as going to a dinner party. You would just change your entire being. But we came here for a reason. My body, your body, is the ultimate processing machine, the ultimate technology for spiritual alchemy that nowhere else on any other planet has ever been possible. I don't know if you get the gravity and magnificence and wonder of this. What is spiritual alchemy? It's simply being able to stay in one form and transmute something into something else while staying in that place. Previously, in your incarnations on Venus, on Sirius B, on Orion, you were incarnating to learn a lesson. For example, if you were incarnating as a mountain, you learned stillness. If you were incarnating as a grasshopper, you learned spontaneity, okay? But in a human body, it's the only place, thanks to who we are, and thanks to all of the manipulations and the DNA mashups that happen during the war phase, we get to be spiritual alchemy masters. Whoop, whoop. Can you celebrate that with me? Yeah, yeah. That is huge. Your body is incredible. We are pure magic, walking, talking. We are uncovering the light codes. We are uncovering sacred DNA. <laughs> oh, and so I'm going to shift now into question mode. Yay! <laughs> oh, so... If you have any questions for me, I would just really invite you to let it rip in the chat box because we have a lot of brilliant people here in the room and you are brilliant listening. And you know, it's complex. It's complex stuff. We're talking about seeing the world from different perspectives. We're inhabiting a three dimensional realm where things are physical while we're transcending past the fourth dimension of time to seeing things from the first fifth dimensional realm. So the heart perspective is up here. That's where we get to say that nothing we've ever done is bad or wrong on a karmic scale, even though here in this realm, it's definitely not like we condone murder. You feel me? So we get to adopt different perspectives because we are these complicated creator beings. So question has just come in. Can you speak on angelic realms and how it relates to what you talked about? Mm -hmm. So what's really beautiful about the angelic realms is that they are always part of who we are. So some of us went directly from this oceanic consciousness to being angelic helpers. Some of us went to elemental realms, which means the fairy realm, which means the mer people realm. Do you have anything more specific in your question, Liz, that you'd like to zone in on? Okay, 
I'm just gonna wrap. So each of us in our soul imprint, I mentioned we have a very specific DNA, right? Like our soul architecture is unique. The soul has 12 dimensions. And on the upper dimensions, we are in tune with our beautiful archangel architecture. All of us, no matter what planet we decided to call home. And that just means that the higher up the scale of awareness we go, the more wisdom of the Godhead that we get to tap into. And I feel like explanation of the 12 realms of the soul is its own discussion. And the multidimensionality of your own soul journey is gonna be unique and beautiful. And I'm happy to recommend some books. Now, people who are from the angelic realm face specific challenges on earth that are worth mentioning. We have this specific, it's called an embodied angel. So you can have an embodied mermaid, an embodied fairy. And what that is, is a soul who comes directly from the fairy realm, who comes directly from the mermaid realm, who comes directly from the angelic realm and says, I'm going to have a human experience. And what that means is that they show up with particular vulnerabilities and naivete. They often end up in abusive relationships because their desire to make it right is so strong and they're so overwhelmed by the density of earth and they've bitten off a little more than they can chew. And it's okay to bite off more than you can chew. When we signed up for these assignments, we were in the form of all powerful, all supported, 100% full light being generals. And we looked around us at this football team of support. And we're like, we got this, let's go. And then we got here and nothing can prepare you for the full spectrum of emotions of earth. Nothing can prepare you for fear and terror and not feeling safe. If all you've ever known is safety and to feel cut off from the first time is really scary. So if you're feeling like you're an embodied angel, if you're feeling like you're from the fairy realm, go into nature, spend lots of time alone, tune into beautiful music, because more than anyone else, you are oh, feeling so much emotion for you, because you, you are returning to innocence faster than anyone else. So you are a guiding light doing the emotional work, it might be harder for you, but you're also doing it faster and you're also doing it more powerfully than anyone else. And so you need more support. You're more sensitive. Be careful of sound. Be careful of toxins and your skin. Be careful of toxic relationships and toxic environments. Really, really be discerning in the relationships because you deserve to be held and seen by fellow souls. Really check in with yourself often. Is this supporting me? Are these boundaries feeling safe to me? Is this conversation feeling safe to me? Run away into nature, go home, hug a tree, sit at the base of a giant redwood and feel the reality of who you truly are and the full magnificence of your angelic being and we're all angelic beings some are just more directly it's like a direct flight from angelic realms and other people have been traveling for five hundred thousand years but if you took a direct flight baby this is a lot so please be gentle with yourself and i'm so excited for you to experience what it's like being with others being surrounded by fellow fae that's just short term for like fairy folk <laughs> And for people from Andromeda, you're going to recognize each other through this very strange but very awesome body type of like long and tall and skin. And it feels like you have crystals instead of bones. And you're like these ninjas, but you're so soft and playful. Those are the Andromedans. And so, yeah, go on this journey. Find your people. Feel supported. You deserve it. It's been so important for me. And you deserve that too. Oh, a lot of people. Okay, another question. 
I'd love to hear more about the transition from stalemate and proxy wars to the retreat and the loss of evolution. Right, so, mm. so imagine you have all of these really powerful kingdoms that are able to telepathically communicate with one another and have such a level of interconnectedness that they cannot make a move without knowing the equal and opposite reaction is just gonna blow them to bits. So their technology advanced to such a point in the galactic Star Wars that they couldn't use their traditional weapons anymore. And so when they went to Earth and they felt the frequency transmitting from the humans, like we are ready to play in the I am, in the Godhead and in the individual side of things. And it took a long time. Like I cannot underestimate how much time passed, like how many experiments were done. Lemuria happened concurrently with our beautiful Atlantis. One was seated by the Pleiades, one was seated by the Syrians and everyone was doing experiments. Like what happens when the architecture of the divine mother and creativity and devotion to life is primordial. And what happens when we prioritize the divine father architecture with curiosity about action and control and technology? And they both implode for different reasons, you know? And so what always happened was the power over versus power to would show its ugly head because the beings running the show, no matter how advanced they were in technology, no matter how advanced they were in their communication, they were still in the egoic realm of testing out all the different experiences. And they were in the power over because they had not come to a point where they were having a perspective separate from their actions. They were driven by willpower and the will to dominate rather than to connect, support, and uplift, and to just create for the joy. And so what I see, and the loss of, of the desire and the impulse to dominate is happening right now in the school of earth. So it's this fascinating time because we, as the influencers of the ancient history, which is all happening now too, <laughs> on some level like let's get quantum on it right <laughs> it's all happening now and it's all perfect and remember the Karpman drama triangle when the power over is propelled by the feeling of guilt and the persecutor needs to save that's what happened so to your question like how did they go from being the persecutors to wanting to be these light workers it was this guilt of realizing everything they'd done. It's this exhaustion and it just happens naturally. It's just natural. There's nothing bad or wrong about everyone we've ever been. And so, yeah, do you have any more questions on this live moment? Yeah, something else that really comes through often is a confusion of why so much? I hear this often. Why is it so hard for me? My life is hard. I see people having families, going on three vacations a year. Why is my life always a dark night of the soul? And it really feels like that gets to be something we celebrate. Oh, thank you for the question, Christina. How do we learn more about the 21 planet realms? We'll get to that. Thank you. So circling to the, why is my life so heavy? Well, baby, you chose it. Let's get back to agency. Let's get to empowerment. Let's get to who you really are. Let's get to the badass, super galactic, unlimitless, creative life force energy of you. The you that doesn't judge, the you that accepts who you really are, that is not afraid of everything you're capable of, and this is the guilt part, that does not feel guilty when acknowledging everyone you've ever been. 
you get to not feel guilty about being a Roman soldier who killed a mother and daughter. Whatever it is that you incarnated, you get to bring awareness and just vibe with that rejected part of you. And in, in the Cartman drama triangle, you get to just shift out of guilt once and for all by not needing to fix it, by just accepting it. And the only tool you truly need is your breath and the power of your awareness because that is your I am presence. That is your divinity here now in this incredible human technology of you. Do you feel me? So if you would like to learn more about the different realms, I'm gonna show you some books here. Here are a few. <laughs> so we have um, Anna, grandmother of Jesus. And she talks a lot about the different places we come from. The Pleiades, Keys to the Living Library. Barbara McKiniak, and I can provide all of these for you. Just email me or I'll send you a list. Another great resource about the different realms is the Sophia Code by Kaya Ra. Kaya Ray, Kaya Ra, Ra. And this is a living transmission from the Sophia Dragon Tribe. And what that means is that Isis talks about how she's from Sirius B about how green Tara and different ascendant masters talk about their star origin. Another great resource to learn about the different planets and realms is the Convoluted Universe series by my girl Dolores Cannon, who has passed over to the spirit realm and is more influential than ever. But what she did was hypnotize people to a level of such depth that their I am presence was speaking through that they could answer questions about any lifetime they'd ever lived. So these are literally interviews with light workers, and you get to read about the incarnations and every planet they've ever been on. So I learned a lot. Um, there's audiobooks if that's more your style. If you'd like to learn about the astral realms, the end of autobiography of a yogi is super juicy. <laughs> and Finally, Chris H. Hardy, the creation of Adam and Eve and the battle for earth. I really enjoyed this one because it takes biblical scripture and Torah and it combines it with the knowledge gained from the 30,000 Sumerian tablets. Now, if you haven't heard, this is really big news. Uh, a lot of people are still not acknowledging the Sumerian tablets because they're so disruptive to Egyptology and the study of ancient Egypt. And there's this culture in academia and in Egyptology that Egypt is the oldest ancient civilization. 9,000 years old is the longest and largest and most ancient and fascinating civilization of all. Sorry, baby, ancient Sumer predates you by at least 20,000 years. There's 30,000 tablets, they've been decoded. <laughs> and so our wonderful Chris H. Hardy, she is a PhD, she's a feminist, she is an ancient librarian, she speaks ancient languages, dead languages, she's a G. So you can learn a lot by diving into her realm and just getting still literally getting still and breathing and tuning in, especially when you're connecting in nature and just ask the questions that you would like to know. So another question has come through. How does the structure of time in this realm affect or compound these feelings of homesickness? Mm, thanks for asking. <laughs> So the structure of time is the most useful illusion of all. I love time because it allows me to make love with life. I love time because it allows me to paint. It brings the beginning, middle and end. And the entire reason that we came to earth was to have experiences in our delicious bodies and to make love and to eat food and to have a mango that makes you go, oh my God, right? None of that would be possible without time. 
because time anchors us into one specific space. And there is a pain that arrives when we begin to flood our body with light. There is this ache because we feel the truth of our timeless selves in this now body. And I really like the, like the phrase descension symptoms because it's like the all of you, the I am presence desires to bring 1% more of your oversoul into this vessel, into this now moment more than ever before. That's what enlightenment means, to bring light in, enlighten. And so time is kind of like this crossroads point where the all of you is like squeezing into this little vessel and it can be highly uncomfortable. And at the same time, I invite you to breathe into the discomfort because never before on the history of earth has it been possible for humans to wake up to the fullness of their galactic, heavenly, angelic, astral, multiplanetary, next level beingness. And then to live cherishing our human bodies for the spiritual alchemy as we transmute. And the reason why I feel like we're the real heroes, each and every one of us, because we're doing it, because you signed up for this workshop because you're giving awareness to your friends going through it, because you're choosing not to judge yourself externally and seek validation and play the game, because you're not operating under the illusion. So we love time and we know it's just an illusion and we cherish time because it gives us mangoes and making love and like beach holidays and amazing conversation with our friends. And we know that it's a vehicle, it's a tool. Does that make sense? Yeah, give me some hands up. And that's this dipping in and out of our different realities. So yeah, that feels really good to me. So we have our three phases of our soul and we're leading the way to exit the ego phase and return to innocence. We're not needing external validation in the way we needed before. We are choosing differently. We're getting intimate with the exiled parts of us that we couldn't even accept as reality, let alone parts of us. We're ending self-judgment. We're choosing to practice forgiveness on a karmic scale. So I acknowledge you. You're doing it. You're already doing it. Literally breathing and being, you're doing it. So congratulations to you. You are graduating. Mm. And so from here on in, I would really encourage you to explore your core frequency, to explore the unique DNA of you. What is your song that no one else can sing that no one will ever sing, that will be lost to time if you don't anchor it into this earth now. Because you volunteered for this mission, you have all the tools you need, and you're not alone. You are supported and held. And the greater the mission you sign up for, the greater your team is. And it just keeps getting more real to you in terms of the quality of friends you attract, the quality of mentors that you have. It keeps getting bigger as you step into the fullness of your light. <sighs> so being in this now moment, I acknowledge you. I am grateful to you. We are closing out our perfect time. And the question has come through about Adam and Eve. <laughs> so that is a juicy nugget. <laughs> What can I say about it? So in the perfect world, we would jump into another half hour call. <laughs> and maybe I'll do a separate one about Adam and Eve. When we talk about Adam and Eve in this framework, there's a specific race 
of star beings, of light workers that have been demonized in the spiritual community and they're called the Anunnaki. And some people believe they're a blend of two races, the Draco reptilian from the Orion belt and the Pleiadian. And there's this tendency in the spiritual realm today on YouTube videos and channelers to be like, Pleiadian's good, Draco reptilian's bad. And of course we get to live in this nuanced world. And so there was a planet, a star nation called Nibiru and it had a busted engine. Its atmosphere lacked gold and earth had a lot of gold. So they decided to come and mine earth for the gold they needed. And then they got tired and the workers revolted. And they're like, hey, there are all these human apes around. Why don't we join in this experimentation everyone's doing and create Lulus? And so the Lulus were what they called their human workers. Now there were two different branches of Anunnaki. So one branch was run by Enlil and the other was run by Enki. These are two brothers. One was the official king and the other was the head geneticist with his half sister, biologist sister. And what's really cool is that they had this submission. They're like, oh yeah, we're totally gonna design some Lulus for you. We're totally gonna make you this worker race. And then they had this hidden agenda of the ramping up the intelligence ramping up the ability to absorb cosmic rays, ramping up the ability to be just as awake and powerful as the Anunnaki themselves. So they didn't tell Big Papa King, they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna make you this race. But actually Adam and Eve are the DNA experiments of this beautiful creator couple. And she is Inanna, so if you've ever heard of the ultimate creator goddess Inanna or Ashira, she's the archetype of Aphrodite. She's the archetype of Freya. She's the archetype of the mother. And across all cultures, all ancient worlds, there's this one goddess, this is her. And so what they did is they kept tweaking. They had this beautiful garden. And then finally they're like, oh, let's get really naughty and teach them how to procreate. And that's when the whole jig was up, that God discovered. And if you read the Bible, it says that Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden and put to work somewhere else. And the whole story is a power struggle between two brothers, well, between the creative DNA genetic team and it's a power struggle. So I'll point you to another book that goes even further, Wars of the Anunnaki. So this is like next level. It talks about ancient Sumeria and about proxy wars and just what went down. So if you're interested in ancient biblical studies, retweaked, informed by these new Sumerian tablets that have been found, that's your bread and butter. If that's way out of left field for you, that's totally cool as well. What this does is it reframes things in a new story. It may sound fantastical. It is the story of us. And whether it rings true or not, I just invite you to absorb whatever is fruitful, leave the rest and just sink more than ever into your body, into your emotions and all of that good, good. Ah, <laughs> So thank you for bringing your magical awareness to this workshop. I acknowledge you. I cherish you. Your yearnings are perfect. Your homesickness is perfect. Your frustration is perfect. Your desire to fix it is perfect because it's an invitation to dive into the emotions, to dive and be still with that part of you that doesn't feel like it could possibly be part of you. And yet it is because you're so powerful that the fullness of you can mother anything and the fullness of you can protect anything because you're that epic. I trust you, I know you, I love you. Mm. Sending you so much love and gratitude from my home here in Tulum, Mexico. And if you would like to stay connected you are so, so welcome to stay connected because we're starting, I'm starting, 
a new space where you just get to be surrounded by fellow starseeds and you just get to ask questions and use the entire group as a resource. Does that make sense? Because I don't have all of the answers. You can also book a one-to-one -one mentorship call with me if you're like, I just wanna dive deeper into this part of my own questioning. And I think I'm from this planet, but what does that mean? Or you can listen to my new podcast episode where I go a little bit deeper into the story. So yeah, chill, relax, tune in. You've got this, you're amazing. I believe in you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> This was the first ever workshop for homesick starseeds. And they're amazing. Okay. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Bye for now.